My name is Brenda. I'm a, I'm a product designer um, with this kind of strange background, not that I worked recently in a slaughterhouse. I've been in design for about 10 years, and I've come out of big tech to start a product studio in London called Rival, um, which you ever in Hoxton, give me a bell. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the balance between vision and iteration and the kind of the constant debate we end up in, whether it's internal, um, kind of intrinsic debate that we have, or the debates we have with our partners. Um, and, and amongst teams as a business. And I kind of want to, I want to try and achieve something in 20 minutes, and if I don't, I'm sorry. Um, if I do, you're welcome. But I want to start with a kind of funny, more provocative quote, which is the fact that nine women can't make a baby in a month. And contrary to popular belief, it need nine months to make a baby. And I think this is an interesting point to make because similarly in product and tech, we have this insane principle that we can compress and squeeze things down to their most minimal parts and still get some measure of greatness or, or big kind of visionary work out of them. And it's not really the case. Um, and I'm not saying speed is, is a bad thing. Speed is wonderful. Speed is how you, you, you think fast on your feet and you experiment and change and adapt. But it's not a proxy for a lack of good and meaningful work or a good and meaningful problem that you want to solve. Um, and I think that if I were to look back at the last decade of my career, speed is probably one of the biggest blockers I've ever had to doing really impactful work and creating a vision worth building. Um, and I guess, yeah, just in, in shorthand, that, this kind of rinse and repeat that a lot of us end up inheriting, whether it be uh, designers going into product teams, designers working directly with startups, maybe just startup culture in general, or you're working with stakeholders or clients who just expect more in less because this is the kind of the appetite for speed is, is so prevalent now. Um, the realistic thing is that we're all working under the exact same conditions. Every single person here, actually I want to ask a question, does anyone not have one of these things in their working life today? If that's true, you can get out. <laughs> Like we're all trying to solve complex problems. Um, they can be at different altitudes, I like to call them. They can be big, complex problems, really kind of minutia, detail problems. Um, we're dealing, like I said before, with short time frames from clients or partners or stakeholders. And I've never met anyone in a team, whether it be an engineering team, a product team, or a design team that said, no, I'm good. I've got enough resources. I've got enough people. It's fine. I don't need anyone else. And so it's thinking about this. Uh, it's like, given the pressure that most teams are under, I'm not surprised that we're trying to do things so much faster to the same results or bigger results than we can actually kind of naturally get out of it. And it doesn't take long to, to and I'm not criticizing this, by the way. <laughs> this is just a reality. Um, it might be a good example of a kind of post hoc fallacy here, but either these books existed before the current phenomenon or because of them, but it just seems to be a part of almost like the cultural lexicon of the work that we do, that we use Agile or Lean or the Design Sprint, not that I'm slagging it off because I used to work there. Um, but a good proxy for this is the explosion of like do it quick models. It's the equivalent of like get rich quick for product teams. Get more shit done. Um, when if you work blindly and iteratively and you obsess with just doing more in a less meaningful way, you make shit like this. No disrespect to anyone who worked at Microsoft, anyone who works in word, word processing, or if you, you've worked on this thing before, but this is what creative, intelligent people do when they iterate without a vision, when they chase short-term approval, short-term metrics. You maybe chase a kind of, what I used to call it, Google A. It's a metric that gets you promoted but doesn't help anyone else but yourself. It's that kind of vicious loop, and I think I've tried to distill it down to two reasons why. I think the two biggest killers of really great products, people, people doing amazing things, or well, the two biggest blockers to teams doing good work are what I call blind iteration and concept fatigue. Blind iteration is when a team finds themselves trapped in a kind of almost like a too intense focus on these incremental nudges. How do I move this thing from there to there? 
and then there to there, and there to there. And before you know it, you don't really know where you're steering the ship, and you end up creating that god-awful thing we saw before. And concept fatigue is almost the other end of that spectrum. It's like we need this great big vision for something, but we don't know how to put it in a format or make it tangible enough so we can actually turn it into something real. And I think about management consulting reports that die in the third, it's almost like the kitchen, that like was it the third drawer down in the kitchen bench? It's the equivalent, professional equivalent of that. Things get made, consumed, don't turn into anything, and then die. So it's the decks you never go back to. It's the research reports that never become actionable, or the concept videos that may look great on stage, but don't actually turn into something that's tangible, that goes in your hands. Um, and what I want to try and demonstrate, if I can, is the fact that great visions all start with what I call CUJs. And this is some of the terminology might be shared, but critical user journeys are the best way for you to avoid iterative traps and concept fatigue. Um, basically because it's just a universal way of framing a problem, framing a customer problem. Um, they exist at, like I was saying before, kind of multiple altitudes, a critical user journey for an entire product, maybe one thing, and it may be made up of hundreds, if not thousands, of CUJs that together actually end up, how do I say this, kind of making up the reason for your product existing. And they're very straightforward. A critical user journey is just an important customer goal or outcome. The great thing about that is you can't iterate to change an important customer goal or outcome. You can build a vision for an important customer goal or outcome, and you can do it at the tangible level, you can do it at a theoretical level, but you can't really iterate your way around it and end up with that Microsoft Word thing we saw before. I'm really trying not to rail on Microsoft, it's nothing. So if I was giving an example, I used to work on Google Maps. This is not a direct kind of translation of this, but a high level critical user journey for Google Maps, which almost sounds like a mission, would be navigate and find things to do in the world around me. It's fairly all encompassing, but designing a vision for that is great. Designing a product around that is great, but because they're comfortable at a high level, uh, as a team, you might want to be like, how do I break this down into component parts? What are the critical user journeys that I can own as, say, a transit team? So on Google Maps, the team in Sydney, I think it was, manages transit. So anytime you've ever missed a train, or the train didn't show up, or it sent you down a route for, a, for something that didn't make sense, blame them. I'm an Australian, so I'll take some of the blame. But in terms of localizing this a little bit, Turning a high-level CUJ, say like navigating and finding things to do in the world around me into something a transit team might manage, could be one simple example like, my regular train is cancelled and I need to find a new way home. It's fairly straightforward, we've all been in that, that kind of problem. And the sum of all of these tiny little CUJs would make up the entire purpose of the product. The benefit being, because your critical user journey is constant, you can have hundreds, maybe not hundreds of ideas, that's a bit ambitious. You could have hundreds of ways, thousands of ways, one way that you think you can solve this problem in your product. And if you're wrong, the critical user journey doesn't change, just how you solve and express it does. Um, you can continuously hypothesize, experiment, and test new ways of solving this problem, and progressively over time not end up falling into an iterative trap because the CUJ is holding you there, or create something that's only visionary and doesn't actually end up becoming tangible. Now people ask me, like, what's the difference between these and, and regular journeys? And I always say, it's, it's extremely easy to create a, hypo a hypothetical sequence of events. You say, I've got this great idea. I'm going to invent a user type. I'm going to invent a scenario. And that scenario is going to marry perfectly to how I want to demonstrate how clever I am at solving something that I made up. Whereas a critical user journey is more about what is the actual life experience that's happening from end to end that is expressed in a critical user journey that I can then go and solve for. And it's just a way of framing it so it's more about a customer problem rather than like a single touch point or a hypothetical situation. And I think in, by their very nature, they focus more on the high impact goals that you want to solve as a business rather than these kind of tangible things. When I was at Google, we set up a design lab to solve a, a fairly kind of unsolved problem on Google. I don't think it was an unsolved problem on the web, but 
critical user journeys was the cornerstone of how we built and experimented with new products around solving this particular service problem. Um, all it was trying to do was create better experiences for people looking for service providers. So every year, I think it was in the billions of people, look for and can't find reasonable, appropriate service providers for basic things you try and solve every day. So when we came up with a, a, a team, I say came up with a team, it was basically like a hodgepodge of people left over. One of them was me, feeling special. Um, we come up with a question, like how might we create a better way for Google to solve these problems on Google? Not direct you to aggregators, not throw you down a well and not be very kind of empathetic about the problems you're going through and how we could make them more efficient with technology, but how could we solve them? And the first one is, you get smart people in a room and they'll come up with great ideas. The first ideas might have been, well, we've already got this thing called maps. We've already got some components that we use in search for these kind of queries. Um, and we have some hunches, maybe even have some data. So I think this is actually three of the experiments that came up. You might have said, well, if people are looking for service providers in their neighborhood, maybe they're doing it visually using maps. Is there something we can run to augment maps to make decision making a lot easier on finding service providers? It's not a bad idea. You could run that and learn something. You might be interested in making sure that the right service providers with the right skill sets are kind of pushed towards people looking for these problems. So you might find different ways of expressing that on search or maps. You might even say maybe it's price sensitivity. But even though they might be intelligent, the sum of dozens, if not hundreds of experiments over time, you're more likely to inherit a strategy than you are to create one. So you end up in, again, that iteration trap because you can't have a vision and make it tangible at the same time. Um, the worst thing is, like any team left unchecked will always find a way to reinforce bad behaviors. You'll always find a reasonable measure of your own success, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're actually solving a damn problem for someone. And again, you create this shit. So, I've tried to do a very quick translation here where like a basic user task might be like, I've got a leaky drain. Like there's water and shit going everywhere, could be literally, and you need a plumber to fix it. That might be something that you put into like, I don't know, a list of user tasks that might happen on your platform or your product. And if that is something that you're trying to solve, measures of success could be, all right, we think maybe the number of phone calls that people uh, make from our platform is a good proxy for us like making good matches. Uh, maybe the number of messages sent between people, because you might be able to measure something from Android that originates from maps. Or um, maybe from the business side, it's the number of leads we actually send to plumbers. The problem being that they would give you no signal other than metric farming, is what I like to say, that you've solved the problem well. It's just how many numbers you can move up and down. If you translated that slightly into what would be more of a critical user journey, you could say that a universal need for this product is that people need to find the right service provider as fast as possible. And already you're in a position to derive the same, sorry, the right success metrics for what we want to build rather than that metric farming and optimization from before. So already with a simple reframing, the measures of success would turn into something like, how many matches have we made? What do successful matches look like? How can we delve into this faster? How can we do this better? And how long does it actually take to find someone? And you could ask this from the perspective of every person involved. It could be the provider, the searcher, maybe someone who's looking after their property. And then when you've got a CUJ, you might think, OK, we've already got a product out in the wild. Um, and we're going to look at it end to end and say, like, is it achievable in what we're doing? Is it easy? Is it enjoyable? Anything like that? And you might notice some basic patterns or changes you want to make. You could say, uh, there's a blocker here or an improvement we could make. And if you made them slowly, you might actually increase some of the measures that you care about, so some of those more meaningful matches. But you'd still be making really tactical changes 
like chasing those smaller, more kind of incremental increases rather than a bigger experimental bet. And again, you would be making small sequence of changes over time without a vision of where you're going. So the answer often is, well, let's create a vision of what we could do. Let's throw out the rule book and let's say free from all constraints, we're gonna create this enormous vision of like this is what the most kick-ass product is gonna be compared to what we have right now and oh, we'll figure out how to like, mash those two in the middle eventually. But how would you actually take your vision, I'm so excited, I just found a laser pointer. How would you take that vision and actually turn it into reality? Because most organizations, the bridge between the two looks like this. There is almost, in every case, a fundamental incompatibility between designing for a vision and delivering at speed. So what it was trying to do with the services lab, the design lab, was create a method for us to test hypothetical improvements at multiple altitudes for these kind of problems on Google products that was both vision building and tactical and could be implemented quickly. So it had a few requirements. And I think they're standard requirements for any vision is every vision has to be testable with real people. Every critical user journey has to be testable with real people. If they're not, it's not a critical user journey. It's not anything important that you want to solve. It has to give you insights that are actionable. So it can't be, we learned X and that's important because it feels good and we sound smart. It's like, what the hell are you going to do in your product to actually solve that problem? And it has to build a vision over time. You can't pause. You can't put an entire delivery or backlog on hold. You have to start building. So to really flex my keynote design skills, you start with a critical user journey. And then you would have a bunch of hypotheses about how you can improve this. You can do... Uh, heuristic reviews, you could run sprints, you could come up with hypotheses and prototypes and designs, however you want to. But until you put that in front of someone, it's useless. It's all subjective, it's kind of hearsay. So the actual lab itself is every two weeks, we would be carving off a critical user journey that we cared about as a team, designing prototypes that we think would solve it, putting it in front of real users so we could get answers about or some signal as to what was going to work and what wasn't. And the good thing is when you run this every two weeks, what you end up slowly creating is an enormous backlog of insights about how people are interacting with your product, how well you're solving the problem right now, where you could be going in the future, and that thing just turns and turns and turns. And I think without it, without the lab model, without using a critical user journey as a, what I'm almost like a backbone, we wouldn't have been able to produce like the experimental vision work and build the insights that could be put into backlogs, like tangible pieces of iterative improvements um, without trying to boil the ocean, to be honest. So what I think in traditional terms would have taken up to a year to start seeing really good, valuable results, we started running... Um, code reviews for new features being released in a matter of weeks rather than months, and we built a vision in months rather than years. So it was interesting, but similar, like, simultaneously, we were kind of challenging the idea of how you build a North Star and how you make it tangible by doing it at the same time. It wasn't always tidy. And the big question I always get is like, but which problem is most important? And I like this, I never nail this analogy, but I like the idea of thinking about roads, potholes, and reconstruction. Think about every street. I'm really stretching the Google Maps metaphor here. If you think about every street in your neighborhood is in a kind of varying degree of disrepair. There's a brand new street that's really nice and smooth to drive down, and there's the one that's such a piece of shit you don't go down. And there could be some that literally your car would fall into. And products are kind of the same, in that there's going to be big problems that are blockers for people achieving what it is that you actually do we're trying to solve for them, sorry. There are minor nuances like speed bumps. And it's really up to you how you end up prioritizing this. You could say, I'm going to take all of the high priority items and solve them in one kind of big foul swoop. Or I'm going to take, to stretch this analogy even further, a street. 
and I'm gonna take this big item and then these three little things and then these one medium thing over here and this other big thing in the way because you think that combination of improvements and enhancements and new products will actually solve the problem even deeper. So all I want you to leave away like today with is the fact that the sum of small iterative experiments will not give you a compelling vision over time. You won't get it for free. You need to develop a model internally, some kind of engine that lets you work at two speeds, of now and in the future. Doesn't matter what analogy you want to use, it can be now and future, three feet, 30,000 feet. And the model you should develop should be driven by critical user journeys, because without them, you're going to end up falling in those two traps we talked about before of blind iteration and concept fatigue. I haven't been able to go into a heap of detail, but if you are interested and do want to talk to me about it, just as a general, a general friend, or maybe you, there's a, you see uh, a need in your team for it, then give me a call. Thank you.